Hey, what's up guys? Man, I'm so glad that you guys are here with us today um, as we figure out what life looks like um, without being able to meet in person. Um, but hey, that's not going to slow us down. I want to jump right back into our lessons as we finish up this lesson on Save the Date and we talk about what it looks like um, to date in a good way um, to prepare for the future. Um, you know, for the last few weeks we've been talking about dating and last week Rita talked about how we shouldn't make anybody our everything. Um, and we've come to under, an understanding that dating is unlike any other relationship you'll have. And, and one way that is different is that usually when people start dating, um, sometimes all common sense and all uh, decision making kind of goes out the window. Uh, you know, you may have seen this happen with your friends, right? Like they, they're usually a pretty smart, logical person. And then before you know it, once um, they get in a relationship with somebody, it seems like they start making all kinds of wrong choices and you start to wonder, you know, what's going on. Um, so I, you know, personally, I went off to college, you know, I had a girlfriend when I went to college and things didn't work out and we broke up and it was a messy breakup. And, you know, I was just sitting there uh, trying to get over this and a couple weeks after um, I became single I thought to myself that I was ready to date again and you know so I, I met this girl and we started chatting and before we knew it you know things kind of kept going along and I started dating her and um, it didn't matter uh, how much I, I talked her up to my friends and how much I spent time with them and her my friends always had this bad feeling about her and not that she was a bad person, but just that maybe she wasn't the right person for me. Um, and I remember this whole time, you know, disagreeing with them and, and saying, you know, I, I think this is going to be okay. Uh, and so two months into this relationship, all my floor mates start wondering about me and wondering if I'm really making the right choice. And they sit me down and, and they talk to me about how they feel like I'm putting all these things in the back burner so I can spend time with this girl. Um, so long story short, I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm praying to God, I'm asking God to send me a sign if this is supposed to be the girl I'm supposed to be dating, and lo and behold, he had already sent a sign, and it was my friends telling me not to date her, but I chose to ignore that sign. And further down the road, uh, we found out, you know, she uh, was becoming really controlling and manipulative, and it just wasn't a good place for me to be in, and I could have avoided so much uh, you know drama and whatnot in my life had I listened to my friends but like I said sometimes when you date somebody and you're excited about dating somebody um, you can throw common sense out the window and stop listening to the people around you and so this is exactly what I want to talk about today and and don't get me wrong sometimes it can be entertaining to watch your friends make terrible dating choices uh, sometimes it's sad and you know they make those choices that we wonder you know why the heck would they make that choice like what led them to that choice um, and this is why people talk about regret so much when it comes to dating and it isn't because dating is bad dating can be a wonderful part of um, you know your later school years and into college and adulthood and everything but sometimes when you date before you're ready uh, people can make poor choices when it comes to that person and, and things that you'll end up regretting and the interesting part is that we can see it clear as day when it happens to others, you know. You see it coming from a mile away when it's happening to your friends or loved ones. But something happens when it's right under our nose and, we, and when it's easy for us to miss it. It's easy to say that somebody made a bad choice, but when we have it under our nose and it's obvious, it can be hard to notice it. For example, maybe your friend dates somebody with a bad reputation and you tell them they have a bad reputation, but then you start dating somebody with a bad reputation and you tell yourself, you know, our situation is different. I'm confident that I can handle and we can handle whatever it is. Or maybe one of your friends has clear physical boundaries with somebody and then they end up crossing them and, and you know, you told them not to do it and, and you know, it's a big deal. And then you start dating somebody and your physical boundaries become compromised and you think that that it's different it's a different type of relationship you can justify it you find ways to make excuses about it or there's people that sometimes get cheated on and they choose to keep staying with their partner and you wonder why would this person keep staying with this person that obviously disrespected them but then you get into a relationship and maybe something happens there and you choose to give that person a second chance. It's really easy to notice problems in other people's relationships, but it's difficult whenever we need to look into our own. So we all have, I, I would say, that we all have some basic rules when it comes to dating. We, we don't want to date somebody who is notorious for cheating. Um, we don't want to date somebody that brings us down. We don't want to uh, 
date somebody that treats us bad and we don't want to date somebody that pulls us away from our hopes and our dreams and is selfish. Um, however, when people start dating, these rules sometimes tend to bend a little bit. And, and here's what I mean. Maybe you start saying things like, well, it's fine. He or she is just that way. Or maybe you say things like, I can control this. It's not going to get out of hand. Um, or you can handle the outcome. It's fine. See what I mean? It's like these rules that we had set in stone, they start to change and we start allowing them to bend as we get deeper into a dating relationship. And these views can lead us to a place of making bad decisions. And the question becomes, how do we make the right decisions when we date? Is that even possible? So it is, and I want to look at a story in the Bible today. Um, and this is a story of King David. King David was arguably the most famous king of Israel. And he was known as a victorious general, a great leader, and a man that was after God's own heart. But even with all those credentials, King David still made epic mistakes. So this particular mistake we're going to highlight happened when he was fighting the Ammonites. So uh, the Ammonites were one of Israel's biggest enemies. Think uh, the Kansas City Chiefs to the Broncos or the Falcons to the Saints. Just like that epic rivalry uh, that has always been there. They hated each other. They were their biggest enemies and they're going off to war. And back then the norm was that kings would go to war with their army. So if you're going to war, your king would ride alongside of the army and they would fight shoulder to shoulder with their soldiers commanding the army. But David does something a little bit different. So if we look at 2 Samuel uh, chapter 11, verse 1, it says, In the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab, the Israelite, and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. So that's bad choice number one. David sends his army to fight this massive battle and he chooses to stay at home. Basically what he's saying is, hey, I need you guys to go fight for my honor. I need you guys to go fight for um, our people, but I'm not going to come alongside of you. Go fight for me while I stay home and I'm safe. So this is the beginning of the unraveling for David. And so the story continues while the army is at war. David is chilling at home bored. Now imagine like week seven of summer bored. Like you have played all the video games you could play. You have slept as much as you could possibly sleep. You have gone to the pool every day. You've seen your friends a ton. You have nothing else to do. You have no money so you can't go out. You can't drive so you can't go anywhere. Your parents aren't taking you anywhere. Like that is how bored he is. And it, and. and and my mom used to always say, nothing good happens when you're bored. And man, was my mom right. As the rest of the story goes, one afternoon, David is walking around the rooftop of his palace. And he sees a beautiful woman on her rooftop, and she's bathing. And I know this sounds weird, but this is actually very normal for the time. Back then, what they would do is they would uh, collect rainwater on the roof of their houses, and they would use this water to clean themselves and to you know wash dishes and whatnot. So it was very normal for people to take baths uh, on the rooftop of their houses. So imagine David's castle up on a hill so you can see everybody, and he's looking down and he sees this beautiful woman that is bathing herself on the roof of her house. And immediately, David uh, decides he wants to know about more about her which is super creepy. But at the end of the day, he's the king, so he gets to do whatever he wants. So he sends someone out to look into her and the messenger comes back and he says this. And I want you to pay attention to the wording that he uses. In, in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse three, he says, the messenger says to David, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And what I love about this is that the messenger doesn't say something like, oh, her name's Bathsheba, she's cool, she lives here, you know, this is where she works, whatever. The messenger is very careful with his words. The messenger says, she, the messenger tells David that she is someone's daughter and that she is someone's wife. Because the messenger knows exactly where David is going with this. The messenger knows exactly what David wants out of Bathsheba. So he's basically trying to warn David like, hey, She's not an object for you to just steal from somebody. She's not an object for you to use. She's someone's daughter and she's someone's wife. But you see, King David isn't interested in logic. He is, his judgment is clouded by his emotions. And he may have even realized that what he was about to do was a bad idea, but he really didn't care. He thought that he was the exception to the rule. 
So David goes deeper down the rabbit hole and he'll ask one of his servants next to bring Bathsheba to him, to his palace. And David makes a few assumptions right here. He assumes that he was the exception to the rules. He assumed that, he, that what he wanted wasn't bad. And he assumed that he can manage the consequences of his actions. So David does the unthinkable. He sleeps with Bathsheba and one thing leads to another and she ends up pregnant. So lesson number one for David right here would be that he is not the exception to the rule. Doesn't matter how powerful you are, you're not the exception to the rule. He made an irresponsible decision and took advantage of a woman and now she's pregnant. And it's a complete mess and it would have been less messy had David fessed up to what he, he had done, but instead he digs himself deeper. So when he finds out that she's pregnant, he decides to figure out how he's gonna cover his tracks. So he panics and he calls Uriah, her husband, back from the war. He's out in, He's out fighting in the war. He calls him back home and he says, man, you're doing so good. Why don't you take some time off and go spend some time with your wife? Now David's hope is that Uriah is gonna go home, sleep with his wife, and then when everybody finds out that she's pregnant, it's just normal. It's like, oh yeah, it's, it's her husband. You know, she's pregnant with their child. However, Uriah is a man of honor. And so Uriah, when he leaves David's palace, he pitches a tent in front of the palace and he sleeps outside. He doesn't go home to his wife because he can't imagine himself resting while his troops are out on the battlefield fighting. So the next morning, David wakes up and sees that Uriah didn't even go home. He slept in the front lawn. So he calls him back in that night and he, and he has a big dinner with him and he gives him uh, wine and drinks in hopes that Uriah is gonna become drunk and then he'll go home, sleep with his wife and cover David's mistakes. However, Uriah does it again. When he leaves the palace, he sleeps on the front lawn and refuses to, get, to give into David's plan. Not only that, um, but so David at this point, he's freaking out. He doesn't know what he's gonna do. So he comes up with one final thing that he can do. And this is one of the, I would say the worst thing that he does. He figures out that Uriah isn't gonna go along with his plan. So he sends Uriah back off to war. And with Uriah, he sends a note to the commanding officer. Um, he tells the commanding officer that when Uriah gets there, that he needs to put Uriah in the front lines of the war, where the battle is the thickest, where there is the most violence, and where there is the most death. And then as soon as Uriah engages in combat, he tells the commanding officer to back away from it and let Uriah die. And that is exactly what happens. Uriah engages, and then the army backs away, and Uriah ends up dying, and David, plays the righteous king card and takes Bathsheba as his wife and um, you know ends up living this lie that nobody's going to find out about or at least he thinks so. He thinks his lies, is, his lies are covered up but God has a plan. So we may look at the story of David and wonder you know what the heck was he thinking? Why would he do this? Didn't he know that nothing good was going to come out of it? And the truth is sometimes people look at us and, and think the same exact thing. You know they look at us in our relationships and they wonder what, what are they doing? And even though we're not going to resort to murder, you know, I hope, uh, we all are capable of making boneheaded decisions. We can see how our poor choices can lead us to poor outcomes. But sometimes when we're in the middle of it, we can lose perspective. We convince ourselves that we are the exception to the rule. We believe that we don't, we, we're not going to regret this. We're not going to get caught. We're not going to, we can turn this around. We can make this right. Um, you know, Others don't understand the type of relationship that I have. It, it's, it's different. You'd never understand it. And the reality is that when we believe that we are the exception to the rule, it means that we're just in denial. We're fooling ourselves, and if we're not careful, we can end up in a situation like David. Well, probably not exactly like David, but stuck like David, and surrounded by the results of a bad decision. It's easy to see what David did wrong and wonder why he did it. Why did he keep making the wrong decision? And I would say that the reason that David did this is because the whole time David is asking the wrong question, if you really think about it. Over and over, David was asking himself, how is he going to get away with what he did? What can he do to cover up his lie? How can he avoid the consequences? So every decision that he made was made through that lens. And because he was the only person that was weighing in on his decisions, he was able to make excuses and make all of the bad decisions. And when you believe that you're the exception to the rule, you can justify anything. We can tell ourselves things are okay when they really aren't okay. This is even more true in our dating lives. You know, we, we tend to justify a bad situation and allow unwise choices to be made. And we all do it. 
But here's the thing. You owe it to yourself to be honest with yourself. Not only just in dating, but also in everyday life. Let me repeat that. You owe it to yourself to be honest with yourself. So when it comes to dating, you need to ask yourself the right questions. Is there an area where you find yourself thinking that you can get away with something or get around the rules? Is there an area where you're telling yourself this may be true for others, but not for us? Is there an area that makes you think you got things under control even when everybody else tells you that it isn't under control? In other words, are there areas that you are not being honest with yourself in? And David was the king of Israel. He was powerful, he was wise, he, he had everything he ever wanted, and even though he had all that going for him, he finds himself in trouble. So what makes us think that we are above that? What makes us think that we won't fall into that? When David realizes, when does David realize he, mess, he messes up? Well, that's when Nathan enters the story. So Nathan is a prophet, and if you don't know about prophets, prophets were people that would get the word from God and they would communicate it with God's people. And Nathan helps David with some of, of the perspective that he needs. He shows David his wrongs. And David listens because he finally has the clarity that, that he needed. And we all need these people in our lives, people that can point us towards honesty when we're lying to ourselves. So this week, I'm gonna encourage you to do three things. Number one, find your Nathan. This could be a wise friend, this could be your small group leader, this could be an adult in your life, somebody that you trust, a person in your life who's going to tell you what they think you need to hear, not what you want to hear. Number two is ask them to help you in the areas of life where you are not honest. And this sounds scary, but but hear me out. You don't need to give them all the, all the, all the details and all the workings of, of the issue because chances are, if you give them just a little bit and they are a close friend, they may already know what you're going through. And number three is listen to them. Even if your trusted advisor has awesome things to say, but you decide not to listen to them, then whatever, they, whatever information they've been giving you is falling on deaf ears and is useless. If chances are that if you don't wanna hear it, you definitely need to hear it and you definitely need to realize that there's something going on. Guys, you owe it to yourself to have a clear view of your life and of your choices. One of the easiest ways to do that is to get someone that is honest and loves you to speak truth into your life. The big idea is that being honest with yourself now will save you a lot of pain in the future. We can all end up in a million different places where we don't want to be, all because we didn't ask the hard questions and because we didn't listen to the advice from our Nathan. To end up where you want to be, both in life and in dating, you need to be honest with yourself and let someone else be honest with you. You owe it to yourself to be honest with yourself. It's truly one of the best gifts you can give yourself. Guys, that's all I have for you. Man, I love you all. I miss you all. I can't wait till we get to hang out again. Stay tuned on the student page, uh, both on Facebook and Instagram to see what other ways we're gonna work this out, um, what other cool things we're gonna be able to do during this social quarantine time. Man, spend, use this time, spend some time with your family, spend some time with your siblings, use this time that God has given us in community to really pour into the relationships around you because that Nathan that you're looking for may actually be closer than you think. Love y'all, see you next week.